Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast. So today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dana Agar Newman and Jeremy Shepard. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for uh, thank you for giving me time. Thank you for making time in your schedule, Jeremy, in, over in Switzerland and getting up early. You, Dana. So appreciate your time, guys. We're going to do little intros, if that's all right. I know for you guys just as much as anyone else, pretty hate doing the intro about yourself, but I'm going to come to you first, Dana. If anyone doesn't know who you are, would you mind just giving us a brief one or two minute um, intro to you? Sure, yeah. Um, so I work for the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific um, as a senior practitioner and out in uh, the University of Victoria as a head strength conditioning coordinator, uh, mentoring students and teaching as well as we have 475 varsity athletes. Uh, prior to that, uh, did a lot of work with rowing and rugby. I uh, was with rugby for seven years, um, culminating in 2016 at the Rio Olympics with the women's sevens team. Nice, mate. I'm the baton over. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeremy Shepard. I um, currently am the uh, like working with Canada Snowboard, which I've been doing for about five years. Um, I returned to Canada five years ago from Australia and uh, spent the previous uh, those previous five years balancing work between the Canadian Sport Institute and Canada Snowboard. Um, and recently, I've just uh, moved to focus on snowboard. Um, I've been a strength and conditioning coach since the 90s and have had the good fortune early in my career of working with a lot of different sports, which was, uh, which was really helpful. Um, and then, uh, you know, found myself in Australia working with some amazing people doing some, some really cool projects and, and uh, you know, kind of making my way in the world as a strength and conditioning coach and uh, still very, um, very driven to, to do that today, particularly in slope style snowboard where I am now where you have these kind of complex movements and you're trying to make sense of those in order to you know make a difference in performance in a uh, a less traditional sport you know not too different from the work that I did over seven years with surfing um, certainly a departure from the work I did with you know more traditional Olympic sports but uh, you know it's it's fun I'm doing cool things with cool people sweet most important thing thanks for that so we got you guys on because you feature in an excellent chapter in High Performance Training for Sports Second Edition, which has just come out in the last couple of weeks all over the world. Forgive me if, if this is wrong, but chapter 12 on jumping landing training. Chapter 12, Jeremy? Yes. Yep. Perfect. So a little brief intro to the book, and then we'll dive in uh, in this episode, which will obviously focus around that exact topic. Sure. Well... The jumping and landing training um, chapter in the first edition was um, was something that you know at the time I was I was really pleased with the project. I was really really very empowered by the editors, um, which sometimes you're um, you're restricted a little bit by the publisher and where you want to go with it. Um, so it was a an amazing experience. And when given the chance to update it in the second edition, it, I didn't think for more than a moment that I really wanted to do this second edition with Dana because we've been working together um, in, in really high volumes and, and um, Dana's work is directly related to this as well. Uh, the context that he works in, really applicable to this chapter. And then a lot of the research that he's doing, that he's leading, uh, are is completely relevant to this. So um, it was just a no-brainer to, to write this chapter together. And I'm really pleased with the outcome, but also really humbled by the chapters of my colleagues. Like they've, I, I thought, oh, this is a nice improvement. And then I look at the rest of the book and I'm like, wow, everyone's brought their A game uh, and, and done an amazing update. Um, I don't, I can honestly tell you, I've never been this excited about being a part of a project. That's class. I, I'll be honest with you. This was, it was almost my, the first edition was almost my Bible for the podcast in the early days reading a chapter thinking this person's cool it's probably where i stalked you from in the early days jeremy um thinking this is cool and just doing some more digging one thing leads to another and stalking these people to come on the podcast so i was super excited to get the second edition but jeremy has set you up absolutely superbly there dana um and i'm so i'm going to come to you and i've split this episode up into like testing analysis jumping then landing so hopefully the flow kind of uh, works reasonably well. So when it comes to jumping, Dana, 
testing analysis, what options have we got? Because you mentioned a couple in the book, but what options have we got? What pra- what options have practitioners got and how would they potentially go through a process of choosing what is most applicable to them? Yes, that's a great point. I think thinking really carefully about our how we're testing jumping uh, is more important now than ever because technology is expanding rapidly. Uh, and there's a lot of tools out there which are going to give you a number of jump height, um, but it may not actually be how high that athlete's uh, truly jumped, their center of mass. Um, and it may not even be a valid number. Uh, so I think, you know, it's really important understanding how jump height is being calculated with the tool that we choose. Also, the, the logistical constraints of the tool that we choose. So how does it uh, run athletes through a testing battery? Uh, so, you know, can we use this with a team of 24 athletes? Or is this a better tool to use with, you know, one athlete? Um, and even if we're using something, say, like a force plate, you know, our choice of software uh, can also impact, you know, whether or not we go with one company versus another company. Uh, so the commonly used tools out there, um, you know, the flight time, let's talk about how it's measured, the flight time method. And there's a number of tools that use the flight time method. Uh, one of the, the great tools is the MyJump app on your iPhone uh, that measures flight time um, through the, the frame rate of your camera. Uh, so you can calculate how long the athlete's in the air. Uh, also using the flight time method would be something like a, an opto jump or a jump mat. Uh, another commonly used tool, you know, real simple that you'd see used in high schools would be something like a Vertec, uh, where the athlete just jumps up as high as possible, hits as many veins as possible, and then you measure the difference between their reach and how high they touch. And then a lot of us now are using force plates, and you can use single force plates, um, you know, multiple force plates, so you can right, uh, measure right-left asymmetries, and that uses the impulse momentum method. Now, it's important to know all those tools are going to give you a slightly different measure, uh, so you'll jump higher using the flight time method often than you will using the impulse momentum method on the force plates. And the reason why is the flight time method assumes that you take off and land in the exact same position when in actual fact most, a- most athletes are going to land with a slight flexion in their knees and slight dorsiflexion in their ankles. Uh, so they're, it's going to inflate the jump height slightly. Um, something like the force plates, it's measuring how far the center of mass travels. If you move to a tool like a Viacon system, which is a motion capture system, um, you know, you may be measuring a different point and measuring, um, you know, the change of that marker in, in space. Um, so you can measure different areas of the body and how far those are moving. So each tool has an advantage. They also have cons and it's important that you weigh those out like price and what's available to us. Um, the other thing you got to think about is uh, the sensitivity of the tool that you choose. Uh, so looking at the reliability of it um, as well is going to be important and comparing that to the difference you're trying to detect among the, your population of athletes. So if you have a wide dispersion of athletes, you know, you can get away with a little less accuracy. Uh, but if you have athletes that are really close together, um, you know, you want a tool that's really sensitive in detecting those changes. Not, not to throw any brands under the bus here, Dana, but is there anything, any yeah. particular type of tool that people should be wary of and there's there's probably into the hundreds of options that people have got now whether it's wearables or something on your phone apps is there any particular method that yeah you would stay away from because of all the errors that you just mentioned yeah so a couple things i'll say one I, I wouldn't stay away from a tool just because technology is changing so quickly i'd say it's important that you take the time to compare the tool that you're using to you know a gold standard out there so something like uh, impulse momentum method for measuring the center of mass, right? And, and you make sure that you're trying to measure the same thing um, or to the Viacon system. Now, one thing you know to definitely be wary about is if you are using force plates and you're using a pre-canned solution uh, in terms of the script and the numbers are coming out of kind of a black box to you, uh, are you identifying the start point of the movement correctly? Is body weight being inputted into the equations correctly? So you're using a quiet uh, portion of the movement to detect body weight. Uh, Are your force plates drifting? Uh, And are you zeroing them between jumpers? Uh, That's really important to consider as well because there's a lot of times that I've noticed with these uh, pre-canned solutions out there, the start point of the jump isn't actually being identified correctly. There's either a little bit of movement before the start point or it might be a little late, but it's usually the movement before the start point. And those errors are going to be compounded throughout the calculations of jump height. 
Uh, that also has a big impact on, say, uh, time domains. So if you're looking at something like RSI mod, uh, your, your time of movement is actually going to be incorrect. Uh, so you, you just need to be very careful with how the numbers are being cal calculated and that start point when you're using force plates. So when it comes to identifying the metrics that we actually want to analyze once we've decided which method we're going to use, how does that differ? How does that conversation or that thought process differ between sports? So for instance, something like a volleyball when there's repeated jumps and pretty hundreds throughout a, a, a game versus... I don't know, rugby or, or soccer? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. And I think you should always be trying to take your testing and compare it to what your KPIs in the sport. Uh, because there's so many metrics that come out of, uh, say, a force plate. It's like our, our script right now, I think there's 90 metrics, maybe even more that come out of there. But you, you really should be trying to narrow those down because a lot of those metrics are actually telling you the same story a lot of those metrics may not actually be reliable and to focus on. So let's start with that. Are those metrics reliable? And then your metrics that are reliable, then you want to be comparing them to key actions in the games or your KPIs within the games. And so when this metric moves, does that metric in the game move as well? Uh, so Jared, I'll let you touch on volleyball. Uh, but, you know, with rugby, there's certain jumping metrics which may be related to something like sprint speed and may be related to something like sprint speed in certain level of athletes and may not be related at certain other levels of athletes. So you need to you know, be very careful and always be comparing it back to your KPIs um, and saying when one thing moves, does the other thing move? So you can look at, um, you know, say different levels of athletes, that'd be a basic level of analysis. So are these metrics different in lower level athletes compared to high level athletes? Uh, then you could look at say a regression approach where you're predicting uh, you know, a performance on one axis and you're taking your force plate tests on the X axis and saying when, you know, the force plate metric moves, I know that I can expect to see, you know, a certain movement in this performance metric. And then probably a more advanced, um, you know, way of doing it would be looking at an individual level. So you're saying with this individual athlete, when this metric moves, I expect this metric to move over here in the KPI. Um, so you're, you're just getting more and more refined down to that individual but you know, initially, you know, just doing something like looking at high and low level performers is probably where I'd start, and then you can start to get in the weeds a little bit more. Do you want to have that on the? Uh, Jared, what's your thoughts on volleyball? Sorry. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, at first, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind just, uh, just saying how much I resonate with your point on the different metrics. And Dana, you and I have talked about this over coffees and on hunting trips and all sorts of stuff. Um, the the breadth of variables that are out there and and there's an attraction sometimes to metrics that may sound like they explain a whole bunch of things and and we're looking for the holy grail so to speak but i sort of look at some of those metrics like like a pop song um you know it's like it might be catchy and it might be enticing for a little bit but the reason why you forget about it 6 months later is cuz the music's pretty crap you know like when you really break it down, you know? Um, so you do need to think about all the things Dana mentioned around, you know, its relevance and repeatability. And and I think the KPI thing to, to bear in mind, if we bring this, say, to, you know, one of my passions, uh, you know, working with volleyball players for an extended period, is that there's some, there's some sports where the KPI is the outcome of the jump. And the outcome of the jump is how much you displace yourself or how high you jump. And that's really important not to forget. Like that's the purpose of the jump is to jump as high as possible. And the variables that we look at can help us differentiate an individualized training. But as Dana alluded to, um, they may be a thing that where you're saying when this variable changes, we see this sport performance aspect directly change. But there might be variables within a jump or even just a style of jump. So it could be a the context of the jump where that that context rarely or never occurs in the sport but it has a relationship to a component and then that component relates to the KPI skill so with volleyball if i think of the spike jump where you have an approach um you're you know you might say well there's no depth jump involved but what we found and have repeated to find over and over again is that depth jump performance 
is related to your ability to attenuate those forces in the approach and convert from horizontal to vertical. So if you're looking for measuring that in context, there's so much noise. But if you take a depth jump, that's very repeatable. So you have this repeatable depth jump, and that depth jump relates to that transition ability of horizontal to vertical. So back to where Dana's saying that transfer and translation is the influence of the depth jump and its unique way of developing, or in this case testing, the stretch shortening cycle relates to your ability to take those steps and then transition in the penultimate step to convert into a vertical displacement. It's not cause and effect, but it has a high influence on that. So then you kind of connect those dots to the actual performance. And so you may not speak to a volleyball coach in great detail about all these different kinetics and kinematics, but it's fairly easy to say, look, we're trying to, we're trying to hit over top of the other team. So we need to have this huge displacement. This is a component of it. This is where I'm breaking it down, and this is why this athlete is doing more of this type of training, and this athlete is doing more of this type of training. And to me, after a really long time doing this stuff, that kind of analysis still is very exciting for me. I, I love it when you actually get to write that program based on those differentiations that you make through that analysis. Jeremy, if you... Uh, Jerry, oh, go, Mike, Dana, go. Oh, I was just saying, Jerry, you're bringing up a really interesting point and you make me think because there's a big push right now about making testing super, super sport specific. And in the end of the day, we have we already have a test that's very sport specific. It's called watching the bloody game you play, right? And so the question really becomes, okay, well, why is this athlete not able to jump as high as, you know, the, you know above the blocker? And you need to take the test and make it more general. Another example of that would be something like uh, aerobic fitness. You know, a lot of these aerobic fitness tests have become super, super sport specific. Well, if the athlete tests poorly on it, well, was it because they have a poor VVO2? Was it because they have a poor change of direction ability? Was it because their anaerobic speed reserve wasn't big? You're still left in, okay, well, what is the limiting factor here? Uh, so you really need to th think critically about how sport specific you make your testing. There, there is a time and place for it. But if you really want to tease in what is the limiting factor with this athlete, there is a place for making your tests more general. And you can really tease out what is that limiting factor with that athlete. Absolutely. It's funny, it's funny because that conversation kind of I mentioned the anaerobic speed reserve with Gareth Sanford on, a, on an episode recently about aerobic testing. So very uh, on topic there. So Jeremy, just going back to one of your points, and Dana, I'd love to get your opinion because you kind of touched on this as well. So if you're working with various different populations, use volleyball as the example because that's the one that you use, Jeremy, with elite, elite females, then you've got a <clears throat> amateur boys, and then you've got a youth population. Choosing the metrics that actually, like you say, link to performance, they could be very different based on the the experience and the level of the player of the sorry of the athlete. So you have to do that analysis each time. Is that right? That'd be advisable. Yeah, I think you need to learn your context. Um, and this is this is a not a, a quick fix if you're new to that specific population. Um, I prefer with volleyball players, what, what you'll often get is you might work with a national program, but depending on the country that you're working with, you might, you might think national program, I'm just working with the 18 people that are trying to go to the Olympics and the 12 that are going to eventually go to the Olympics. Um, but that's not the case in most countries unless they have um, like a, a supernatural depth in the sport. So you were, you know, you're sort of looking at maybe a 15 year old. And for me, you know, the, the, the thing where you're comparing the, the 30 year old and the 15 year old is there's just so many things going into that, like growth and maturation, uh, because you might do your neuromuscular analysis or your, um, your, your, your sort of profiling. And there might be similar components across that huge age range and competitive level. But the, the thing that might, you know, that really might make the difference between how you will train those athletes 
may actually just be like, oh, I've identified some correct things to do, but I'm still not going to do them because of a myriad of other reasons related to their ability to tolerate that training load, whether it's biomedically ethical to do that. Um, if they're growing an inch every week, that's going to influence what you do. Um, you know, because some of these 15 year olds are, are just really tall and they're getting taller or even 17, 18, 19 year olds. And so you're, you're thinking like, we're, we're, we want to be here for a good time and a long time. <laughs> and so you, you might subordinate the correct thing neuromuscularly. You might subordinate that in the hierarchy of training needs because they have so much gain to make elsewhere. The analogy I often make with this, Rob, is uh, similar to nutritional supplementation. I don't like to buy supplements for athletes who cannot drive past a McDonald's. Because what's, what's the point? It's like we're trying to have this wonderful, um, you know, sort of approach that's specific and we're doing blood tests and all that stuff. Well, you have to earn the right to, to be in the penthouse suite, right? You have to have a foundation. And so that 15-year-old volleyball player, that 20-year-old volleyball player, they may really need a lot of other things first. And it's not that it's not important, this other cool neuromuscular stuff. But they're getting a lot of jump volume from playing this sport. And maybe I really don't want to add to it until their movement is better, their knowledge of recovery and regeneration is better. Because if I keep adding highly individualized training just because I can, and my ego says that that makes me feel better at the end of the day, I may be creating a false economy and also false messaging. And the athlete will pay attention to what we measure. As Matt Jordan says, measure what matters. So if I'm measuring it, I'm emphasizing it. And if I'm emphasizing it, I'm emphasizing it to them. And I'm even non-verbally saying, this is what this national team is about. And that means that there's a limited capacity for them to understand that we are also about taking care of your rest, your mental, you know, your mental state, you know, we don't want you to be as soft as a marshmallow. We want you to be hard, you know. We want you to learn the game. We want you to be a student. We want you to be a well-rounded person. We want your character development. And so we, we don't, you know, we don't, you train a dog, right? Like you, you coach people. So we need to bear that in mind um, as well. I guess the other thing I'd say too is increasingly I'm influenced by my colleagues, particularly, you know, so where... I tend to look at differences between men and women in a sport like volleyball where participation in both sexes is really high um, because one of, the, one of the challenges is if you have a sport where the depth and participation in, in the women's is really low, it's, it can be sometimes difficult to actually make you know, well-intended differentiations between them. Um, whereas a sport like volleyball is wonderful because the participation is high and the depth is tremendous. Like tremendous, um, fascinating sport in both men's and women's. And so I find myself looking at things like stature, their height and their strength levels, and looking at trends like people who present this way. So rather than men who, women who, it's people who. There's other sports where that may not be suitable, but, um, but for volleyball, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating approach to look at it. Dan, have you got anything yeah, and about and that? If, 100%. Like, those are all great points from Jaron. The other thing to think about is um, as the athletes move up in some sports, the top level can be quite homogenous. So there's you know, the, a variable that could separate high and low-level performers may no longer separate high and low-level performers. And the metric you look at may be slightly different depending on your population. So the analogy I'd use is like, um, you know, you want to go out and find your life partner. And so you buy a ticket to a dance. And so the metric you need is that 15 bucks and you get a ticket to that dance. But once you get into that dance, other skills begin to mat matter. Can you dance? I can't dance. So I wouldn't be successful, <laughs> but other people can dance, right? So it's, you know, money matters initially. Later on, can you dance? And it's the same thing with testing an athlete's. Certain metrics, which may be important in low-level athletes, may no longer separate the population with your higher level athletes. And so that's important to be aware of, especially when you're interpreting the research, a lot of the research, college age athletes. Yeah, 100%. Let's move on to jumping, away from testing onto jumping. So 
once and it may sound trivial but i'd love to get your thoughts on just the process that you would go through when choosing an exercise i know that's a pretty big question but i'll come to you first dana um what would be the process for you when you're first starting out i know it might be in reverse so we're going to the end that actually putting the exercise on the sheet but i'd love to i'd love to get your um if you're you're taking your process with that yeah so i work with uh diving as well and wide variety of ages and uh, training ages with that population. So the youngest divers I'd get in the weight room at 12, 13 years old. Uh, my oldest diver who was in Tokyo was 27. And so very different thought processes depending on the levels of athletes. Initially, it all comes down to teaching them a wide variety of movements in the gym, teaching them to land properly. Um, and it's all about you know teaching those skills, maximizing training days. Um, but it, it, everything is you know skill, skill, skill. With a higher level athlete, uh, it comes down to the assessment, driving the exercise selection. Uh, so the tests I will do with athletes, I'll do a loaded jump profile. I'll do an isometric mid-thigh pull. Um, I'll do a counter movement jump. And my loaded jump profile is uh, squat jumps. Uh, and then I'll also do a depth jump profile. And from those tests there, I choose out my variety of exercises along with a conversation with the coach uh, what is he seeing technically and hope that I can address technically within the weight room? Because uh, there's some things that are really hard uh, to measure if you get stuck using that single tool um, that gives you nice, easy numbers to interpret. And so I think it's really important that you go back and, you know, look at that athlete qualitatively. How, even if you have an older athlete, have a discussion with the athlete. Um, you know, what do you feel the limiting factors to your performance are right now? Uh, and that will determine my, my selection of exercises. Um, initially I was really big on doing the force velocity profile and, you know, gearing my higher level athletes training off the uh, force velocity profile. And, you know, I was finding results exactly like you, you find in the research where everyone's jump heights improve initially. Uh, but after a while, once they're optimal and, and divers got to optimal really quickly, cause they're doing a ton of jumping every day, they're, they're training consistently in the weight room. Uh, what I ended up doing is biasing them you know to you know more force dominant in the off season and then i'd try to shift into optimal and i'd use the force velocity profile more to sharpen the knife um, leading into competition um, because i found if i was just trying to keep them at optimal i wasn't actually moving the the needle at all and so i'd really bias the training the strength and then you know leading the competition we do more velocity based training to to gear it towards optimal uh, the loaded jump profile, um, you know, if you find that you need to work on the elasticity of your athletes, the stretch tolerance of that athlete, um, you know, something I would also recommend where the athletes jump off a series of increasing heights. And uh, the key thing to, to note is the athletes should be experienced at uh, depth jumps um, because otherwise you may get some, some interesting results which may not align with what you see out there in the research. Um, but if they are, what you find is that the athlete will jump height will continue to increase as they drop from increasing heights up to a certain point, and then it will start decreasing again. And the question that Jared and I talk a lot about is like, should we be training at the optimal height? So where they're jumping the highest off the boxes, or are we better to train slightly at the deflection point where they're starting to come down again to increase their stretch tolerance? Um, for me in the off season, I will train at the deflection point and then lean into season, I'll train at that optimal. Uh, so where they're jumping the highest, uh, I don't have any research to back that up. That's just what I've been doing. Uh, seems to be working. Um, Jerry, you want to tag in on that one? Cause I know we've been chatting about that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, I do this. I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, obviously with, uh, currently working in a context where, um, where landing is so critical to, mixing in heights beyond the deflection point and even well beyond the deflection point but the idea is they're just they're actually just landing um so they're doing it, it appears that they're about to do a gigantic depth jump but they just land and then mixing that in with deflection point jumps and then moving that in to to optimal um where where appropriate uh, but obviously we have um a lot of abuse that goes uh through the athlete's body from the sport itself so you you have to you have to obviously be very targeted so it's not like on mass all the athletes are doing something even like that because um it's not whether we have a cranky ankle 
in the team. It's who and how many cranky ankles and cranky knees and cranky backs we have because, um, you know, they fall out of the sky and, and try to put their feet underneath them and it doesn't always go that way. Would either of you ever train below that deflection point or would it always be at or above? I do. Um, I think I use yeah. a different style jump. Uh, so I don't instruct them to jump as high as possible in those lower heights. So let's say the optimal jump height for them is, uh, is uh, let's say it's, they're fairly well trained in this and it's 40 centimeters. Um, having them do these, these uh, lower, lower heights where the point is to actually not necessarily optimize the impulse, but to uh, basically get off the ground as quickly as possible. So it's a, a different style. And, and when I write that in the program, that's a drop jump versus a depth jump. Mm -hmm. Dana, were yeah. you going to do that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I never speak in absolutes because, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. I think a lot of the time when people are taking information from podcasts, it's like, oh, this is what this person does. But, you know, I'm, I think Jared would consider me a numbers guy, but I, I'm a big believer that the numbers should influence what you do. They shouldn't drive what you do. Um, and so, you know, you should always be putting a little bit of art into your training, um, you know, for yourself to try new things. Um, also for the athletes. Yeah. It's the sneaky host getting you to say things that you don't want to say, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> so what you've, what you've described there is what you say in the book as stretch tolerance assessment. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. One, one thing that you mentioned in the book as well is around variation. And I've had a couple of people on who were big proponents of lots and lots of variation. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on why that potentially wouldn't be the case. Dana, I'm coming to you again. I'm throwing you under the bus here, but. No, this, this is actually the biggest change to my training uh, probably over the last 10 years with athletes is I prescribe way less variation. Okay. Um, and, and the programs run for a lot longer. Uh, so what I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the name Anatoly Bondarchuk, um, which he has a certain training program for throwers and I got interested in his training and, you know, I, I was working with a number of rugby athletes who were chronically injured and, you know, the, the typical training with, you know, variation, uh, you know, every four weeks, the programs would be changing. Uh, it, it just wasn't working. And so, you know, I really tried to simplify the program down to, you know, what are the key components? And I sat back and, you know, I prescribed exercises, which I could monitor the athletes improvements. And it was interesting that athletes, you know, were improving in the speeds they can move these loads for, a, you know, after session, after session, after session. At one point, you know, I had a, these two athletes and they trained 28 days in a row and they were doing a three day rotation of exercises and they were, you know, improving, improving, improving. And I've had a chance to trial this with other athletes over the last couple of years. And what I've noticed is, you know, athletes will continue to adapt to an exercise uh, you know, for much longer than what we typically initially learn as S and C's. Um, I have a rugby player that plays over in the UK and, uh, she actually, uh, did 17 sessions leading into the premier 15s final. Um, and she was just repeating the same, the same sessions. And I've got the tables of her improvements across different exercises and just continue to improve. The interesting thing too, is when you keep your training consistent, um, you can really see the effect of outside stressors uh, and what they can uh, what they can do to the, the movement speeds and the quality of that athlete session. And so it's a, it's a great uh, tool for that athletes to learn, you know, how their la lifestyles impact their training. Now, you know, the criticism of this method, and I don't think it's for everyone, is it can be monotonous. Um, but the 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 caveat to that is, you know, if you're monitoring the athletes and, you know, I present the information in a real simple way so that they can actually see their improvement, it graphs itself. Nothing, nothing motivates athletes in my experience, like seeing their improvements. And so if they know it's working, uh, you know, they want to keep doing it. And so, you know, to go back to that rugby examples, you know, at the end of the Olympics, you know, we're starting up the next season. And I asked the girls, I was like, okay, we've got a year of consistent training, no injuries, no niggles. You know, do you guys want to keep doing this? And, and they said, yes. And that surprised me because I thought they'd want to get back to, you know, getting, you know, two days off a week, a day off a week. Um, but 
you know, they, they could actually see the measurement measurable improvements. Now, very different. I think you always need to look at, you know, the, the culture of the sport, the nature of that athlete, what drives them. Uh, it's not something I would use um, with every athlete. Um, but, you know, that we're, I think we're missing out on some adaptation with athletes by, you know, in, adding variation uh, too often in the programming would that change depending, I'll come to you for your opinion on that, Jeremy, in, in a second, but would that change based on the the experience of the athlete, the training age of the athlete? Uh, so I haven't done this with young athletes. So, I, you know, that's something to note. Uh, it's typically experienced athletes who are, you know, highly motivated. Um, the one thing I will note is there's different types of reactions you will see to certain type of exercises and also depending on the the... Um, the level of the athlete. So if it's a, un, someone who's just starting this program, novel exercise, you'll typically see a linear improvement in an exercise. Uh, then there's some athletes, which you'll see kind of the, almost that super compensation where they start the new program, the performance drives into a hole for about four or five sessions, and then it comes out and it's pretty consistent. You'll see a, a small peak around that 12 session mark. Uh, so it's that number of set times they're hitting that exercise uh, that seems to be, you know, leading to those improvements. And then I, Apparently, and I've never run it out with athletes, but there's even a bigger peak, you know, around 40 sessions, 30 sessions. And, you know, someone like Derek Evely uh, would be the guy to talk to about this. But, um, you know, it, for me, simplifying programming allows me to understand, you know, what works, what doesn't work with athletes. Um, and so, you know, that's another reason why I've, I've really moved to less variation in my program. What's your thoughts, Jeremy, on variation? Dude, I don't know. Um, to be honest, um, I uh, and I don't mean that like I, I don't have opinions. I, I just think that the context is so important, as as Dana was mentioning. Um, you know, like I'm I'm pretty intimately aware of what's uh, what the context is for for say a diving program like Dana works with because of our ongoing conversations and discussions that we have and I, I, I can tell you that I have had times in my career where I definitely thought that variation was something that needed to take place and, and I, I, I made changes too quickly and I made changes to too many things um, and now, but now that I'm working in a context where everything else is changing all the time as well, that's why I just say like, man, I'd, I don't, I don't know. Because like, if I worked for a country in this sport, just even a different country, my view on this might need to change so that I would be more successful in delivering my role. So all I can tell you is what I think is working now as of today, and it might change tomorrow, but I live in a country that gets uh, our our field of play is available to to us in terms of riding mountains um, for a lot longer than some other countries. And then you know when we don't have good snow, we do things like come here for for a glacier. You might uh, like there's some good snowboarders in our sport that were that live in countries that don't actually have a mountain, and so they might have these extended periods where very much like low variation is something and you can you can measure it and you can be fairly confident that what you're measuring is is the biological response to the training impulse well i mean most of the guys i work with are semi professional or at least high level skateboarders as well and there's a lot of jumping and landing in that so if we're off snow and they're not jumping and landing off snow they're jumping and landing skateboarding and there's all these other things that we don't measure. And so if you're a control freak, you should stay the heck away from the sport I work with because you would view it as chaos. I just view it as complex. So the other point I would make, and Dana mentioned this in terms of monotony, is you, you need to understand perceptions too. Is like I work with athletes now that some of them I would consider elite athletes, and they are also elite snowboarders. Let's say about, well, I, I, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but for them, four or five years ago, they wouldn't have identified as an athlete at all. 
So when you kind of are trying to build engagement and buy-in through helping them understand things, you need to understand like that they may be a participant primarily because of fun. And although it might be obvious to us that the work that you might want to do off snow is directly relined with what they want to do on snow, the fact that they show up suggests that at, at all. So if you can then not screw that up, like if you can deliver something that feels for them like it is um, applicable and, and that might mean introducing variations simply because they identify that if you add the rotation in this jump that it feels more like that switchback 16 takeoff that they're trying to get that snap for. Even if, even if you don't think that's necessary from a skill acquisition perspective, as long as it's not harmful and you're still able to achieve the neuromuscular outcome, outcome you might introduce that variation simply to connect it mentally so that they're not mindlessly doing the work because they won't mindlessly doing the work, do the work. Um, if they did, they probably wouldn't be an elite snowboarder, right? Because they know what that feels like. And so they're, you got to connect their heart and their head with where you're going. And, you know, it's their journey and we're just helping them on. Like they're the pilot, I'm a navigator, and sometimes I'm an engineer. That's all it is. But they're the pilot. And so the pilot has to feel good about the, about the, the path that they're taking. And so I, I will admit, I have variety sometimes in there that is a consequence of having a coffee with an athlete and them telling me about a trick and then just asking me if we can make that work in the gym. And I'm thinking, yep, yeah, but that's not necessary. But it's not harmful. And so if I can get what I, what I feel really confident in neuromuscularly accomplished, and I, I think it'll transfer whether we do the little bit that they like and who what do I know I've never won an X Games and I don't even know if I work with anyone who hasn't so they're the pilots right I got to listen to the pilot as well mm -hmm. nice yeah I think it's it's really important when we uh, talk about our training to really clarify what problems we're trying to solve uh, because the solution in one case as a strength coach may not be the solution in another case like we forget something like block periodization with, you know, from Berkoshansky came about because he got banished to Northern Russia in a technical college and couldn't go outside and jump, right? So they start lifting weights in the winter, right? That was a good solution for his problem. In Jeremy's case, working with snowboarders, it's a very different problem he's trying to solve at times than what I am doing with, you know, divers. Um, and then in my case, working at the university now with 475 athletes you know i can't sit there and monitor each individual athlete's reaction and so the how i program at the university is very different because it's a different problem I'm trying to provide service with a broad breadth of solutions for athletes uh, versus you know a real deep individualized solution and so i think you know really clearly de delineating our problems and our logistical restrictions um, you know our mindset of our athletes before we write these programs um, you know, it's a key part that's often missed. Often we put one foot in front of the other and, you know, implement a solution uh, before really thinking deeply about the problem. Rob, what Dana said, that, like, I babbled on there about, you know, the context, and, like, that's just, that's just spot on. Um, and, and Dana, like, you bring up the diver, and it's, they're, they're, they're essentially artists, like, it's an artistry, an expression, not in that sense similar to snowboard, but the diver, it's part of their culture to do repetitive work. Like they don't practice things till they get it right. They practice it till they cannot get it wrong, right? And then that becomes part of a suite of dives that they do, that they rely on, and it's the tools in the toolbox. And there's no other tools. It's like I'm putting this toolbox together. Snowboarders, they need to approach competition with so much variety. So they're habituated to being like, I got it right, two to make it true, what's up next? <laughs> you know, like switchback 16, landed it, switchback 16, sweet, I'm going to no, go now, you know, front 18. And, and you're like, you're just trying to keep up at this stage with the amount of variety that they're used to. So um, 
you know, there, there there's those cultural things that I think are pretty critical. Mm-hmm. I'd like to get your uh, opinion on a, a topic that came up in a in a podcast pretty quite a while ago with Dan Cleaver, and it was around force vectors and choosing exercises based on vertical and horizontal, which got a bit not from me, but got Dan a bit fired up. So I'd like to um, I'd like to get your and I'll come back again to to you, Dana, to get your opinion on that piece in your mind when selecting exercises and selecting strength strength exercises as well as 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 jumps and, and plyos. Yeah, I'd say if you get too far down one rabbit hole, you're probably wrong. Uh, so, you know, doing a variety of different, uh, you know, jumps, horizontal, vertical, you know, if, if you need to you know, project yourself in a horizontal fashion, you might want to include some in your training. But if that's all you're doing and you're gearing your whole training program around that, you're, you're, you're probably wrong. Uh, so, you know, to simplify this even more, more, if we look at the relationship between uh, someone's one RM front squat and their force output in an isometric um, scrum uh, machine. So you get like a little strain gauge, you put it in between and you can see how much uh, force they can output. The relationship between those two measures isn't perfect, okay? So there are some technical uh, components that, you know, separate some athletes and they're able to, you know, orientate their forces horizontal uh, better in the scrum uh, than others. Um, and so, you know, it's, there's a skill and there's an art to projecting yourself horizontal, um, but there is a relationship there. So I think, you know, you, you do need to practice, you know, projecting yourself horizontal and jumps if that is, you know, part of what you do, um, but it shouldn't be all of what you do. Um, you know, it should influence what you do. It shouldn't drive what you do. Any thoughts on that, Jeremy? Anything to add? Dana's covered it. No, that was awesome. <laughs> yep. Cool. Happy days. One one little piece in the in the book, and it's a a little a little piece at the end. I think it's uh, maybe the last page in the chapter, and it's from Tim Pello giving his giving his his takes on uh, on things jump jump and land training, and he mentioned jump sustainability, and not only been able to jump as high as possible, but been able to sustain that in sports like volleyball, basketball. When when it comes to programming, exercise selection, how you actually think about things, how you actually frame things. Is that different versus a sport that requires one big jump? How does that play in your mind, Dana? Them two separate things. Uh, well, I think that comes down to conditioning, right? You you, you need to train what you do, uh, so you need to increase your capacity of movements, and you need to increase you know how high you can jump, um, you know the, your maximal ability, and both those things are important. If you were in a sport like a volleyball, like we'll come to you in a second, Jeremy, what would what would change? What what aspects would change in the program to build that repeatability? Well, there's a couple of things. One is I probably wouldn't be doing much jumps at body weight. I'd probably be uh, stimulating certain qualities, doing stuff at heavier than body weight, lighter than body weight, because already uh, doing so much j- jumping at body weight. Uh, I'd probably also be looking at um, some work, worst case scenarios and trying to implement that in the training. And are they already getting that in the training? Um, and if they are, then I wouldn't be doing that, um, you know, outside of the training session in the weight room. But in some cases, it may only happen um, at certain times in a game for certain athletes. And they're not getting enough to actually stimulate, um, you know, the, the physical qualities that are required. And so you do need to pull it out to a more general setting to stimulate certain qualities. Um, so I think it's, you know, you have to look at the whole picture and, you know, what are they getting just playing the sport and then, you know, fill in the pieces around the sport. Volleyball example, Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll refer back to um, some some uh, data eyeballing that, that we've done over the years with volleyball. And w- what happens when you work with a unique sport like volleyball I guess every sport thinks they're unique, <laughs> but <laughs> when you're working with a sport like volleyball, where there is so much jumping, you're going to come across, you're going to have the good fortune of, of meeting a freak. Um, and the longer you, you spend in a sport like volleyball, just like the longer you spend in a sport like track and field or, or any sport, really, you, 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 you meet someone who's got an extraordinary physical quality or extraordinary skills. And in volleyball, that that shows up often because you're testing jumping all the time. And and you'll 
you'll, you'll come across something that just doesn't match what you were taught in a textbook in your undergraduate degree in the vast majority of correlation studies, is that your outlier in vertical jump can often be your least well-rounded, you know, strength trained athlete. So you'll get these freaks who will test um, something that just literally like water cooler conversation worthy vertical jumps. But in the gym setting and just in any assessments that you do, just on the, their platform of strength and even movement competencies, um, you know, they're, they're not the impressive one. They're, they're often one of the ones you're most concerned about. Where that will manifest is they will have the largest uh, drop in their jump sustainability. They will have the biggest decline. So between um, the first set and the fifth set or over the course of a tournament. Now you could argue that because their starting point, their best jump, let's say their counter movement jump is a uh, is 100 centimeters, um, and they're you know they're volleyball players, so they're so, you know they're they're quite tall as well. So you have this person that jumps and touches this ridiculous amount, like 375 centimeters, or something absurd, and you see this huge decline, and you say, well, you know that's okay because at the end of the match or at the end of the tournament, even they're still jumping better than other people. But it still leaves clues worthy looking at, right? So it may not be that when you get this freak and we get excited and think, oh my God, I'm going to take his vertical jump, which is 100 centimeters, and I'm going to be a part of making it 105. And that might be what you get really excited about. But really the work that's, that's punching you in the face there is if someone is declining that much that they're you know, over the course of a tournament or over the course of a match, um, that opens up a big window of probability of injury because they're playing under tremendous fatigue. Literally speaking, they cannot handle the rigors of their sport. And if they are this alpha that is, you know, a major athletic quality on the team, the, the success of the team is related to their ability to stay in the match. So, the work actually might be the boring stuff, not the, you know, excite, I want to, I want to put my hands on this 105 freak kind of thing and be a part of that. That's, that's our ego. The actual job to be done is to think, well, if I can give them movement competency and breadth and repeatability with good movement, um, and in particular, making them say neuromuscularly just stronger, that's going to make each landing less fatigue inducing and so by making the landing now relatively less fatigue inducing you don't change the game but the game is now relatively less fatiguing for that athlete and their jump sustainability will then improve and so what you need to put your ego around is I'm gonna make their last match of the tournament or their fifth set performance you know much much better um, and, and that's a that's something that I've found to be really intriguing and fascinating in, in volleyball I'm gonna stay with London Jeremy and stay with you because that's your that's your baby uh, London valuations is there something that we can do practitioners can do to actually get some more information so we can do the things that you've just mentioned with the with the programming. And would that differ from a jumping athlete like a volleyball, like your, your example, versus a rugby athlete or a soccer athlete that's that's not jumping regularly? Yeah, I um I think with our landing assessments, there's uh there there's a critique you could make out of on all of the philosophies and all the different methodologies that are out there. Like the one I use, I have my own critiques of it, but it is the one that the, that has the greatest net benefit for usability. So we, we, we have a, a landing procedure that everybody does where like everybody in the sport does where they are landing off of a height. It's 50 centimeters. It's the same test that we developed in Australia um, for surfing. But we've applied it for all these different sports, and it's it's one of those non-sport specific but often sport relevant assessments. Um, but you could critique it. You could say it's an unnatural landing because you're dropping from a height. Well, there are sports where you drop from a height that you don't jump to. Like that, that's a fact. Like in surfing, you 
you don't jump you you know you move up the lip with your board and then you know gravity and the shape of the wave pushes you off and um you know with snowboarding like you don't you don't jump onto the side of a rail like at the olympics the rails are like eight feet off the ground they're like (laughs) scary as heck you you basically fly off that rail and you pop off it so you actually add height so your center of mass rises as it goes off this thing and you fall possibly your center of mass falls like three four meters um so it's you could critique all these different ones you could say it might be better to just look at the landing in context of the jump itself so if you're on a force plate you could just do counter movement jumps and look at the landing from that counter movement jump you will introduce some variability though. And there's already a fair bit of variability in landing. So it just depends on which, you know, what what aspect of it you value the most. And I would demystify that down to one single question to get started on which assessments you would want to look at is, what's the most usable information for you? So whatever is the purpose and the why behind doing the assessment what's the usable information are you in a context where you need an assessment to help make better decisions in returning them through you know the health and and wellness pathway post injury well that may bias the the value you place on let's say extremely high repeatability so that might eliminate some of the options but then perhaps you want something where it's more of a a holocratic decision uh, around the athletic competency where involving therapists and, and technical coaches and mechanics, you may look at something that is more in context. It really just depends on what decisions you're trying to make and who's helping make those decisions and, and what value you want to place on it. I'll come to you in a second, Dane. I just want to follow up question there, Jeremy. On a broader sense and dragging in i suppose other sports and and people who work in in different environments what can a landing tell us about other things that isn't related to the landing deceleration for example i'm thinking yeah there's definitely a lot to be a lot to be said for that um and we have found um looking at some of the key metrics in a landing being how long it takes you to stabilize after that landing uh, as well as your ability to attenuate that peak force in the landing. Um, we've found that that can help us really inform the impact of different strength training activities. So I'm almost flipping your question into a different context where I'm saying we may have learned more about the impact of exercise selection and, and helped us actually eliminate exercises where we're like, well, this is here for general strength, but then we're not seeing a huge impact on this part that requires a lot of strength, that deceleration. Um, and so we may look at other things like using, um, like not always using ISO, um, like ISO inertial strength training, using variable inertial type strength training and looking at its impact. So some people might have a different why for using um, variable inertial type activities. But then we've, we've been looking very closely at using variable inertials in context for its specific application to developing deceleration ability. Um, Because the volleyball player often needs to land, let's say it's defensive uh, situation, they're at the net and they go up to block and it's contested, but the ball is still in play, they may have to jump again or backpedal very quickly to transition to a viable attacking position. Right. And so there's all these different movements that they need to do that require different joint angles and deceleration. Whereas in, say, snowboarding, your landing may be like your butt is down in between your feet, like your hips are pla- practically touching the inside of your ankles. And you're we call it, you know, squatting it out and you just you can be down there for a little bit longer. The judges won't hate it, hate it that much, but you're not trying to put your hands down because they're going to take points off for that. And you definitely don't want your knees to explode in seven different pieces either, which unfortunately sometimes happens. So you've, you've got to kind of look at it as like with, with the landing and with how you're trying to train that landing is, well, what's your context? You know, like the way, the way Dana's divers do their jump is, has been fascinating for both of us to discuss, but the same way that they do their landing. And 
when the ski cross athletes, which I, you know, shared the snowboarders are often sharing the gym time with, with the best ski cross nation in the world, uh, I would, you know, say is, is probably the Canadian program. I mean, those, those guys and girls, their landings are like, it's like an elephant's coming in the room, you know? And I'm just like, oh my God, I have to do something here. And then I watched their sport and went, I should just shut up and learn their sport. Cause I don't, I don't really understand it. I don't know why they're so heavy. Whereas our athletes, it's got to be, you know, really very, like we're looking for that nice, you know, softer, softer landing, just a few G's, right? Not these, these big percussion style bass drum bang on the, on the landing. So again, like, and, and this is, I know I've just given an answer where I basically just said it just, it depends, but <laughs> The, the thing is, don't get upset about that. Get excited about that because this is the stuff that will still keep you as excited as I am after doing this for like a million years. You know, like it's so freaking and exciting because growth is really exciting. So learning more about how to uh, take your craft and, and make something better is is really exciting and, and spending time understanding your sport is is really exciting and and then you will see those points of difference show up in the way you program and the way you test amazing dana anything to add on jeremy's points? no I, I think that the context is, is so important and how the athlete lands could influence the metrics that you are seeing so for example if you uh absorb the force over a greater time you're going to find lower peak forces and that becomes down to impulse which is force multiplied by time uh, which is essentially is your change in momentum. Uh, but that absorbing the force over a greater time may not be applicable depending on some sport that you know you may be working with. And so you may have to absorb that force quicker, which results in, in order to get that same area under the curve to change your momentum, there's going to be a higher peak force. Um, so just be aware that the athlete's choice of strategy uh, should be probably sport dependent. And, you know, the strategy is going to influence, you know, what you look at in terms of the metrics. So when you look at the research, um, you know, your sport may be different than what you're reading. Perfect. Well, I know you've got to be somewhere in 15 minutes, Jeremy, and I've kept you guys well over an hour, which is the, the, the promised allotted time. So I'm just going to do a little roundup. But now I, I really appreciate you guys giving me your times in the, in the separate time zones and, and making this happen. But Dana, where can people get to know more about you and your work? Great question. I do have a, a semi-useful Twitter uh, profile. Uh, you'll see pictures of my hounds, which I'm not sure if you noticed halfway through one of my hounds was going off and you're asking a question. And it's like, I think I got that question, but uh, <laughs> well, the dogs were going nuts. Um, you'll find, yeah, some, sometimes I'll post musings on there. Sometimes I'll be hunting photos. Um, that's pretty much the only thing, but uh, feel free to share my, my email um, so people can get a hold of me if they're interested in anything. Sweet. Jeremy? Um, my social media is Shepherd Coach. And uh, sometimes on Instagram, I'll post things, but it's usually, um, you know, reflections and philosophical questions and just trying to connect with friends around the world. Love it. Thank you very much. And I would encourage anyone who hasn't already to go and get High Performance Training Spots 2 and read the chat, read chapter 12. Um, from these guys so thank you very much for uh, for joining me and i'll chat to you both soon thanks for having us cheers guys thanks again rob